Let's go ahead and open up our Bibles together to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 1 through 18. So let's uh, give honor to the Lord. Let's stand and we'll read, pray, and dig right in. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. These are the words of God. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have authority to eat and drink? Do we not have authority to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have authority to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not consume the fruit of it? Or who shepherds a flock and does not consume the milk of the flock? Am I speaking these things according to human judgment? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while it's threshing. Is God merely concerned about oxen? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, Is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this authority over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this authority, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. But I have used none of these things. And I am not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case, for it would be better for me to die than have anyone make my boast an empty one. For if I proclaim the gospel, I have nothing to boast, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I proclaim the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my authority in the gospel. Let's pray. Our Father and gracious God, guide us, we ask, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light, we may see light and in your truth find freedom and in your will discover peace through christ our lord we pray amen amen you can be seated well by way of reminder uh, paul has been discussing the various questions that the corinthians had posed to him and chapter eight was an answer to the tenuous issue of eating meat sacrificed to idols Uh, paul Paul, and in, in really, he, he insists on a third way of love. <laughs> we can call it that, I guess. A third way of love. And he explains that the strong have lawful rights. The strong who are able to eat the meat, sacrificed to idols, they do have lawful rights. But the weak, whose consciences are fragile and delicate, they have equally valid needs, too. So you have rights, but you also have needs. And so those are all both equally valid when it comes to the conscience. And Paul, we mentioned this last week, tyranny from the strong and tyranny from the weak are both unacceptable terms and conditions for Christians. That's not a, it's a bad formula. It's a really bad recipe for disaster. And instead, he says that love paves the way to dealing with rights and responsibilities. Love deals with rights and responsibilities. And he tells them, Idols do not exist. You know, they don't, they don't exist. You have the freedom and the right to eat. 
without your conscience defiling you and without you losing your faith and going to hell, that sort of thing. However, he also says that you have a greater responsibility to love your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Notice I said a greater responsibility. There is a greater responsibility to love your brothers and sisters in the Lord, which may very well require you to lay aside a lawful right. So love trumps liberty of conscience is the message. Now, at the center of Paul's teaching is this issue of freedom and responsibility. The Corinthians had it all out of whack. He, he just taught them how to diffuse the situation regarding meats and idolatry. And unless, unless they think he doesn't understand, Paul gets very personal here in this section. And he proves to them that he doesn't just preach this, he actually practices it as well. It's not something he's just preaching to them. He's going to bring up interpersonal stuff with them and prove to them these aren't just words. I do this. This is how I live my life. And Paul has plenty of freedom as an apostle, and yet he has a greater responsibility to live within the confines of the law and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has rights that he can invoke against the church in Corinth. He, he can do that. He has rights. And they, <clears throat> he would be just in doing so, mind you. He is their spiritual patron. They are the clients. They owe him big time. They owe him. They are indebted to Paul. And he says, here are my rights and my freedoms. But then he is going to come back and say to them, well, I'm setting all of those aside, just like I told you, for the sake of the kingdom. Again, love trumps liberty of conscience. Now, <clears throat> in order to help them better understand the problem, he uses himself as an illustration. He kills two birds with one gospel stone, choosing to deal with the financial tension that existed between them, as well as the larger problem of love that is basically non-existent in this fledgling church. And the text tells us a lot, tells us about tithing and paying pastors and ministers, but it's set within the context of Paul's relationship to the Corinthian church. So their, their connection started off quite well. Paul leaves Athens, goes to Corinth, and sees the gospel take root. So it, the relationship was, was really good, but now it has some rocky moments. They keep writing back and forth. Uh, he catches wind from somebody in Chloe's household. Something's afoot, <laughs> and he needs to deal with this. So it started great, but then things got rocky, which is typically how churches function anyway. Um, we're all trying to love Jesus and each other, and that's not always easy. So Paul brings it home by talking about money and ministry, but he's really talking about freedom and responsibility. So let's look at our text here and work our way through. He begins with a rhetorical, a set of rhetorical questions there in verse 1. Is he not free? That is, is he not free to eat what he wants? Is he also not free to receive their financial support? He is indeed free like the Corinthians are. That's, you know, Paul was really good at rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions help make the point without, you know, having to make the point. And apparently some in the church had questioned his authority believing him to be sort of a, a, a lesser apostle. You know, we, uh, we know James. James is the brother of Jesus. I mean, we have Peter, Cephas. He's, he's a big deal. But Paul, you're kind of a scrawny, ornery guy. And they thought him to be quite less than them. And for the, from the Corinthian perspective, who is he to boss us around like this? But he asks, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Remember, Paul supported himself with a leather-based uh, tent-making side hustle. <laughs> uh, the tents then were made out of leather, and so he was quite good at that. But him doing that was not really helping him curry favor with the Corinthians. Uh, real apostles get money by other means. Um, many of the famous philosophers and speakers would come into town and and they would have somebody who sponsored their trip back home and they come and they raise money and they give their wonderful, beautiful sophistry <laughs> on the stage. And, and Paul's sort of a ragtag guerrilla warfare type guy uh, and he's making tents. Can we really take him seriously? That was in their mind. Because those who work with their hands 
in this culture weren't really highly esteemed. They weren't highly esteemed, not like those traveling philosophers. They make money by wowing the crowds with their speech and rhetoric. But Paul makes it very clear. Have I not seen the risen Christ? Did Paul see the risen Christ? He did. We just read about it in Acts 9. In fact, later in 1 Corinthians 15, he's going to mention that Jesus appeared to 500 plus people and to one untimely born himself. So he doesn't even elevate himself. He's like, I may not be the first that got to the tomb, but I was definitely in line. Paul was a, a freelance missionary, we might say, but that doesn't make him a lesser apostle. So he asks a fourth question there. Are you, talking to the Corinthians, not my work in the Lord? Are you, Corinthians, not my work in the Lord? Aren't you a result of my labors and my efforts? Now, regardless of what they understand or not, he says in verse 2, whatever they might think, he is certainly a legitimate apostle to them. He may not be an apostle in the eyes of anyone else in the known world, but to them, they should know this. They should know this. They are the seal, he says, of my apostleship in the Lord. Their conversion to Christ proves to be a fruit of Paul's constant work, his labor, his prayers. And they, they should have been the very last people to criticize Paul and dispute his apostleship. They owed him so much. And he says here, they are, they are essentially the wax seal on the envelope containing Paul's apostolic marching orders from the, the risen Christ. They are, on the, they are the seal of that. Now, Paul defends himself. In verse 3, he gives himself, this is an apologetic, an apologia. To those who would dare scrutinize him, he asks in verse 4, Do we not have authority to eat and drink? Notice that word authority pops up over and over in Corinthians. It's going to come up more as we continue in the study. But don't we have authority to eat and drink? That is, he and Barnabas, Barnabas is mentioned in verse 6. Barnabas traveled with Paul often. But he and Barnabas absolutely have the right to food and drink. They have, in other words, they have the right to have their needs met too. They're talking about having their needs met in the church with eating meat sacrificed to idols. Well, Paul has a right to that, doesn't he? They absolutely have that right. They have the right to have those needs met. In verse 5, they have the authority to take along in their ministry a wife, just like the other apostles have done, including Peter. So Peter was married and Presumably, again, we don't know about Paul's wife. She may have left him after he converted, or perhaps she died. We just don't know. The, the historical record is unclear on that. But he says, if their favorite leader can take along a wife and kids in ministry, well, so can Paul. That's no, that's no big deal. If they're doing it, why can't he do it? The family deserves to be supported financially as well, he says. Paul and Barnabas... They did the side gig thing, and they have every right to, to, do, to do that. They have the authority, he says in verse 6, to either do it or not. The authority is theirs to do. It's not the Corinthians to do for them. Paul goes into next everyday examples from natural law. Uh, all of this is from Deuteronomy 25 and the surrounding chapters. But take a soldier. He brings up the soldier. Does he go at his own expense? No. no, no one goes at their own expense. What about the man who plants a vineyard? Does he not enjoy the fruit of the vineyard? The, the shepherds who work with those wonderful, stinky creatures, the sheep, do, don't they consume, consume the milk of the flock? Again, Paul is, <laughs> he is laying on the rhetorical questions pretty thick here. What Paul is getting at is this. Read, read between the lines here. The apostles are soldiers going into the world to wage war. After conquest, they plant churches, and churches are vineyards. And third, once the churches are established, they need to be pastored and shepherd, shepherded. So soldiers are mercenaries, vine dressers are owners, and shepherds are slaves. 
But all he's saying here is that all labor requires reward. That's a built-in principle into the, into the so-called natural, the created order. So their livelihood comes from their work. That's what he's saying. Their livelihood and their sustenance comes from the work that they do. But this isn't just from human judgments. He says in verse 8, the law of God requires it. So Paul uses illustrations from the created order. And now he brings up the law of God. It's a great one-two punch. The law of Moses says there in verse 9 that the ox shouldn't be muzzled while it works. One of my favorite things to say at a potluck. <laughs> Don't muzzle the ox while it's treading. <laughs> it's a great verse that can be taken in many ways. But the text here, he cites from Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. And it's a proof text, he says, for essentially paying pastors and ministry leaders. He also quotes it in 1 Timothy 5, 18. He says those that labor in preaching and teaching are worthy of double honor, meaning extra remuneration. So if you muzzle the ox, what happens if you muzzle the ox? He will starve, right? What happens if he starves? He's dead. And you have no, nothing, you can't plow a field without the ox. So you die as a result. You're cut off as well. So the ox is entitled to eat. And Paul says, well, is, that, is this really just about oxen? Is the law of God here in Deuteronomy really just about oxen? Paul says, no, there in verse 10. It's actually about humans. It's about humans. Uh, the plowman and the thresher, they work together for the harvest. So the conclusion is in verse 11, if, if we apostles, so, and by the way, look back there at verse, where is it? Verse 10, you have two people working together in the field and they share the crops. So there's a division of labor, but they're working together to, to have the bounty. To Both of them work. They both do different jobs, but they're working together. So Paul is hinting at partnership and labor for the kingdom, that sort of thing. But in verse 11, if we apostles sowed these spiritual things, if the apostles sowed spiritual things in the Corinthians, he says, well, why wouldn't we reap material things? Uh, in other words, spiritual things matter more than anything because we're talking about eternal life. So why wouldn't the church give generously for the work? Why wouldn't they do that? It's, the Bible teaches it. Now, other apostles, <clears throat> they had authority over the church, but Paul had the most. And verse 12, he basically says that he didn't use that as a club to beat it out of them. They instead endured. They endured all things because they didn't want this thing to be a stumbling block in the work of the gospel. <clears throat> so Paul believed that accepting financial support from the Corinthians would create a potential barrier. The stumbling block language comes up. We already saw it in the previous uh, our previous study. He didn't want it to be a barrier. He, that maybe it would become a serious obstacle to the work of the gospel there, so he didn't take any money from them. He didn't want anything from them. But he wants them to know that he had a right to be paid. You have a right to eat that meat sacrificed to idols. Let's talk about rights. I have rights with you too. And verse 13, he talks about the Levites. Remember the Levites their inheritance was the Lord. We read about that in, in Joshua. But when they're divvying up the land, the Levites weren't given land. They had cities they could live in, but they were attendants to the tabernacle and the temple. But in the temple, they ate the food. So part of the meat, when you brought an offering to the temple, part of it was given to the Lord. Part of it was divvied up for the priests and part of it was to be consumed as a fellowship offering for the worshiper. Pointing to the Lord's Supper, of course, but you're there and, and they have a right to eat from that. The Levites do it. And in verse 13, they receive the tithes from from Israel in that way. So they had a right to share from what was given on the altar. And he says in verse 14 that even Jesus said that those who proclaim the gospel ought to be able to get their living from the gospel. So Paul quotes Jesus from Matthew 10:10 10, 10 and Luke 10:7 where Jesus tells the disciples that the laborer is worthy of his wages. Uh, 
economic law in, in place here applied in this context. But verse 15, he's used none of these things. He didn't insist on any of it. He isn't writing to them with an axe to grind. In fact, he'd rather die. Strong language. He'd rather die than take their money because taking their money would make his boast become empty and void. See, in Paul's mind, there is no boasting except for boasting in Christ. If you want to boast in something, boast in, in the Lord Jesus. Nobody else deserves that boasting. Nobody else can possibly live up to the glory of boasting. No man can. Jesus can, and he deserves it. And if Paul proclaims the gospel, there verse 16, then there's, there's, no, there's no boasting. Why is there no boasting? Because it's not about him. And the reason for this is because he does this out of necessity. He says out of compulsion. Paul is a man that has to preach the gospel. And what he means is, when Jesus found him, what was he doing? In Acts 9, what was Paul doing? Was he like praising Jesus? No, he was doing the opposite. He was persecuting Christians. He wasn't preaching the gospel when Jesus met him. Jesus finds no man preaching the gospel. They need the gospel first, and then they can proclaim it. But Paul wasn't preaching Christ. He was trying to destroy him. Imagine trying to destroy the risen Christ. It's Ascension Sunday. Jesus is ruling and reigning from the heavens. It's a beautiful uh, uh, a paradigm for us to really think about the core of the gospel. People forget it's death, burial, and resurrection, yes, but don't miss the ascension tied to the resurrection because the ascension is when he comes to the Ancient of Days and he receives that kingdom and he has all authority in heaven and on earth. So Paul, Paul was trying to squash that. Now, the sovereign commission of Christ <clears throat> is what compelled him to preach Christ crucified. And so committed to this is Paul that he says, Woe is me! He, he puts curses on himself if he doesn't proclaim the gospel. So were he, to, were he to do this as a volunteer for them, then he has a reward to claim from them. But he has a stewardship entrusted to him. So he claims no credit, which is why he claims no reward, though he deserves it from them. And essentially, a good minister isn't in it for the money, is what he's saying. But Paul does not have a substantial he does have a substantial reward. In verse 18, what is the reward? The reward for proclaiming the gospel is proclaiming the gospel. It's enough. It's ironic here. The reward is in refusing the reward. The reward is from him not taking that because they don't understand what is happening. Paul gets great delight in preaching the gospel without charge because then he is free from having any bossy Corinthian Christians tell him what to do because they don't get it. And he freely preaches the gospel of free grace, free of charge, because the gospel sets men free. That's the sufficient reward. So how shall we then live? <clears throat> The first thing I'd like to point out here is that the gospel really does transform our identity and what it is we value. The gospel really does transform our identity, who we are, and also what it is we value and what we do in the world. Paul illustrates his freedoms. He essentially parades these freedoms right in front of the church. He has the freedom to eat and drink, to have a wife, to be supported by the church and so forth. But he doesn't parade it with arrogance. And the reason is because his actions have proven otherwise. His actions have lined up with his teaching. Paul renounced, he has renounced his rights, and it allows him to quite ably walk in the pattern of a cruciform lifestyle because the gospel has changed him. It's changed him. He, how, what do you do with a man who basically says, I will preach Christ, and the worst thing you can do is kill me, and Jesus will raise me? Ha! Ha! What do you do with a man like that? You beat him, you throw him in prison, you try to squash him. But does that stop the gospel? It doesn't. So Paul has lived this life. He goes on in 2 Corinthians to list all the stuff he's gone through. The shipwrecks and all these things. I mean, what a man who suffered. But he would hate for us to glory in him. 
He would hate for that. The gospel changed him. He was there as a condemned sinner supervising the stoning of Stephen. You remember? And he was on the road to Damascus in order to lock up other Christians. So he wasn't neutral towards God, because no one is. He was hostile toward God. And, and Jesus knocked him down, blinded him. And don't forget what Jesus said to Ananias about him. We just saw it in Acts 9. He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Does the text say, so he can get all the glory and all the money and all the reward? Literally the exact opposite. For I will show him, this verse strikes at the heart every time I read it. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Gives me chills reading that. Think about this, especially in our world today. You know, come to Christ so that you can have money and get a Lamborghini. I know that's ter terribly reductionistic. <laughs> but that's, that's what it's being taught. That's what's being said here in our day. But Paul was brought to Christ so he could suffer. Who signs up for that? No one. No one signs up for that. No one signs up for it voluntarily. Yet Paul knew from whence he came. He knew that he knew the horrible things he had done to Christ's people. To Christ himself. Jesus says, why, he didn't say, why are you persecuting my people? He says, why are you persecuting me? God sovereignly saved him. I, I imagine that Paul, for most of, if not all of the rest of his life, before he was eventually beheaded by Nero, I imagine that Paul could still see the face of Stephen. And it lived with him. You don't forget that. He suffered. And it was amazing grace that God brought him along. But God, Jesus says, I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. So that's the man that's writing this. What does Paul, and obviously by us, us by proxy, what does Paul owe to God? What do we owe to God? He owes his very own life. Everything he spends in his life is to be geared toward Jesus Christ. How can a man who owed God everything ever insist on rights? That's what he's saying. How? As people who have been sovereignly saved by his grace and not our works, we have the right to remain silent about our rights. And when you come into the kingdom... You have been given Miranda rights. And uh, I found this this week. This one writer puts it like this, and I thought that was, this was genius. Here's your Miranda rights as a Christian. Are you ready? Child, <clears throat> you have the right to remain silent from now on about your rights. You gave them all up when Christ bought you with his blood, and you forfeited any claim you thought you had on your person, your possessions, and your life. You are not your own but belong body and soul in life and in death to him. If the Lord of the universe gave up all of his rights for a sinner like you, let's have no more quibbling from you about yours. You have already been given that which you had no right to expect in order to nullify the damnation you were fully entitled to receive. That's gospel preaching. So... When you read an unbeliever <laughs> their rights and you're preaching Christ to them, there you go. <laughs> you have the right to remain silent about your rights because you've been given everything and you weren't entitled to receive it. Only to nullify the damnation you were fully entitled to receive. Paul effectively tells them, rights, you want to talk about who deserves what? I have rights too. You know, but I'm not cashing that check because my joy is the gospel and not in myself. The gospel changes who you are and what you value. It puts the entire world back into perspective. And when we realize what, just what Jesus Christ has done in giving himself in such a sacrificial manner, none of us will ever have grounds to boast, ever. A boasting Christian is not a thing. So Paul deals with freedoms but he also deals with, with, with responsibilities. 
The gospel's work in our lives makes sure that we are valuing things in their appropriate context. A meaning at the center of this passage is the relationship between the minister and his church. And uh, the church has a responsibility to her, her ministers. Uh, the little book we gave out that John Owen wrote, Duties of Christian Fellowship, the very first part of that is what does a church owe to its ministers, to her ministers? And then what, what then um, does the church owe to, to uh, each other? And Paul, Paul says ministers ought to get paid by the field that they're working in. And, and this is by means of the tithe. I'm not going to make a major point out of this, but it is part of the text. And it is something that churches ought to take seriously. Um, ministers and their family, they don't run on air in good compliments. <laughs> um, they too have families to feed, so don't muzzle that ox. And we teach tithing here, and we believe it to be a good and honorable thing to practice. Uh, the church tithes, the church receives the word and sacraments, and that's how it's been designed. But we need to be able to see ourselves as working together. That's part of the greater principle. We're working together in this field. It's not that I am working or the session is just working. We're all working together. We all have responsibilities. We all have the, the great responsibility to never boast in ourselves. But we're all working in different ways. But this is the field we're working in. And um, <clears throat> I think oftentimes pastors can feel as though they're working against the people because they may share a different vision or goal. Uh, that's not a, this is not an autobiographical uh, comment. <laughs> I just, I've seen it before. And you feel like you're not working in the same field and that can be a, a very devastating thing for a church. Um, and depending on whether or not uh, squeaky wheels get louder and louder, controversy can obviously erupt, but, but having a plurality of elders and a head of household system it kind of helps for us here at Cross and Crown. We hope that that is, uh, you know, helpful for communication, for discipleship, and so on. Um, though admittedly, we're not perfect. But that said, <clears throat> I think it's very obvious from the statistics that I've read. Pastors today are notoriously overworked and underpaid. However, I think that those who would identify as overworked don't work <laughs> as much anyway. Uh, caveat there um, you know you don't you don't need 40 hours to write a sermon I think if you do you, you have problems but <clears throat> um, but because of that real dynamic though there are thousands of ministers that leave the ministry every month that is a stat and it's a fact um, when I was when I was interviewing for churches <clears throat> fresh out of seminary because I knew everything you know I was done with seminary I knew everything there is to know I've, no, I've learned more out of seminary. I'll tell you that right now. <clears throat> but this is how things typically went when we were interviewing. We interviewed for a couple of churches in Michigan. Uh, for requirements, they first want you, they want a man to be 25 years old with 30 years of experience. <laughs> <clears throat> so you do the math on that. Um, second, they want him to have at least like a Master of Divinity degree. So that's 90 credits, three years typically. Um, if not a doctorate, which of course requires tens of thousands of dollars of debt, a lot. Itself an issue, by the way, especially with Title IV funding and the government getting involved, and that's a whole other. We got time. We can no. <laughs> um, third, <clears throat> the church is exceedingly happy to pay him twenty-five thousand dollars a year. <laughs> so that is. The crisis that I saw, you want, I'm 25, well, I wasn't 25 then, but you want me to have 30 years of experience as a 25-year-old? I don't remember the first few years of my life. That doesn't count, I don't think. Now, I'm only slightly exaggerating, but that is very much how it works. And of course, there are extremes on both ends where you have megachurch pastors bringing in millions of dollars a year. But I'll tell you, any good pastor is going to, one, hate talking about money. Because if he loves the Lord, he will want to desperately serve him no matter what. Despite the tension of having a family to feed. So any good pastor is going to know that ah, it's like the last thing you want to talk about. Um, not because you shouldn't, we shouldn't 
because God does t teach us about money and stewardship, but it's not the first thing on the, on, the, on the list. But the other thing too, number two, any good pastor is going to refuse to make that the only deciding factor. Um, however, I think, I think past, pastors don't generally have the luxury of just finding another job either, because if you're laboring in a field, you have to like leave that field and go very far away. So, you know, there are some things that come into place into play here, but they, they want to shepherd well. They want to labor well. There's always obstacles to overcome, but many churches will want them to take a vow of pauper, poverty. And I've seen, <laughs> seen that before, but brothers and sisters, this should not be so. And I, I want to make sure I'm clear that I'm just dealing with the dynamics of the text. I don't really believe that's necessarily the case here. Um, I think we have a very generous church and, and, and you all love the Lord and it's clear to me. But in, in verse 13, I want to mention this. Paul clearly pulls from the Old Testament to draw a New Testament conclusion. Just like the Levites in the Old Testament were supported by the tithe, because that's the field God put them in, so the ministers of the gospel ought to be supported by the tithe. But no good pastor, no good apostle, like Paul's mindset here is very clear. No good pastor is in the ministry for the money or the accolades. And I'll tell you why that shouldn't be. Because any real minister knows that there aren't any accolades. If he's doing his job, th there's no glory from the world. If you're getting glory from the world when they pay you to set up a COVID jab center in your church, you've, you, you're, you've missed it. Um, they're not in it for the money of the accolades. There are no accolades to have when you have a world that it needs Christ. And... I will say that depending on how they respond to certain issues, like the COVID lockdowns, they may be men who refuse to know and act on something because his very job and paycheck depends on him not knowing and not acting on something. And there is a fine line here. But keep in mind, we're talking about freedom, rights, and responsibilities. The church owes the lawful tithe and the ministers ought to receive the fruit of it to get their living from the gospel. And yet in Paul's case, he chose not to act on this right because he felt that he had a greater responsibility to Christ's kingdom and mission. And the gospel gave Paul certain rights, including a paycheck. It was his own mission and privilege, though, not to accept those rights if he so chooses. But that doesn't get the church off the hook. Paul is trying to lead by example, which is the heart of pastoral ministry. So follow me as I follow Christ, Paul will say. To the degree that I'm following Jesus, you come along too. And if there are ways that I'm not following Jesus, don't mimic that. We have to deal with that. But he says, don't insist on your own way. Freely give to the work of the kingdom. Freely renounce your rights if it means benefiting someone else. And this, friends, I think that is the heart of gospel ministry. Everyone is called to make sacrifices. All of us are called to make sacrifices. It shouldn't be surprising why? We follow a crucified but risen self-sacrificial Savior. It's sort of built into our thinking, or it ought to be. Jesus would do anything and everything to care for and win the other, the weaker little one. And he would stand in gracious, loving solidarity with them. That's what Jesus did with Paul. Not a strong man. Not on the right side. But what did Jesus do? He saved him. He brought him out of it. And when we realize that's what Jesus does with us, we are more prone to then give generously. We're more prone to serve others. We're more prone to offer encouragement. Um, <clears throat> I think it's this simple. We are more prone to give generously, just generally speaking, when we realize how much we've been given. We are more prone to forgive others when we realize how much we have been forgiven. And we are more prone to show grace to others when we realize how much grace that we have been given. So Jesus, he is a great thermometer. He, he, he's, not even, he, he's not the thermometer, he's the thermostat who sets the temperature of Christian living. He is the standard. So the gospel doesn't just save us for heaven. You know that it shapes us for the earth, that it's here and now. It's our day-to-day -day relationships 
And when we are under the grip of the gospel's power, we are way less prone to insist on our own way. So the gospel does free us, truly free us, to be other-centered. And there is much freedom and there is much responsibility there. So choose wisely. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the teaching of it from the pen of your apostle. And we are grateful that we have not only just the teaching, but we have a glimpse into what that looks like when we live that way. And I would simply ask and pray that your spirit would help us to look deeply within to see if we are truly understanding the great depths that you, Jesus, descended to save us, to pull us out of the pit of sin and hell. We thank you, Jesus, that you are ascended on high and that you leave, lead the captives in victory of which we are and have a part. Would you nourish us by your word and by your spirit and by your sacrament? We ask and pray for guidance, for wisdom in the days ahead. Help us to be sober in our thinking about freedom and responsibility. And may your spirit challenge us deeply. Through Christ we pray. Amen.